Well, good morning, my fine friends. I know that many of us have been hearing all kinds of things, a lot of uncertainty. I talk to family members, I talk to friends, brothers, sisters, children, and I hear the alarm in their voice, and our heart, in my heart, sinks with a, a bit of fear. There's a lot of trepidation about what holds the next month, two months, three months, four months, the economy, the state of affairs of this country, our personal lives, our health, what will happen to us. There's much uncertainty, and the song that uh, John David just sang to us reminds us that in all of this uncertainty, there is one resounding truth that means more than anything else, and that is the King is coming. So thank you so much, brother. The king is on his way. And the book of James really helps us to prepare for that. The book of James really is a book that helps people deal with some of the most darkest times of their lives, especially the fifth chapter. But maybe today you'll see it in an unexpected way of how James deals with the times that we're living in. In James chapter 5, we're going to get right into the text, verse 16 through 20. He says this, and the prayer of faith will save the sick and the Lord will raise him up. That's verse 15. And if he has committed sins, he will be forgiven. Confess your trespasses to one another and pray for one another that you may be healed. The effective, fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much. Elijah was a man with a nature like ours, and he prayed earnestly that it would not rain. And it did not rain on the land for three years and six months. And he prayed again, and the heaven gave rain, and the earth produced its fruit. Brethren, if anyone among you wanders from the truth, and someone turns him back, let him know that he who turns a sinner from the error of his way will save a soul from death and cover a multitude of sins. Our Father in heaven, please come by this place today and help us to receive and to understand the message that James is speaking of, the real heart of what he desires for us to understand about this wonderful prophet named Elijah. May you bless us and be with us in Jesus' name. Amen. So what is James after? What is he getting at? It's something much more than just talking about a little sermon that we give, a sermonette to the sick people when we come with the anointing oil and we say, we heard that you're sick, you would like to be anointed and and God will forgive you if you ask and, and he will heal the sick people if we pray fervently like Elijah. James is hitting at something much more deeper. The first idea that James is after in the first text that I read right there is that God is faithful to forgive our sins. He brings us to that point that when we're at a point of our life where we're feeling like it's all about to end, God is faithful. He is after forgiveness. It is his, his key thing that he's always been about since the day that Adam and Eve fell from the garden. He's after mankind's repentance and their forgiveness. The second thing that James brings out is that Elijah was a man like us. Elijah had a nature like us, which is very, very important. In fact, Elijah represents a very special class of people in scriptures if you remember at the mount of transfiguration there was two people that showed up with jesus right before his crucifixion if you remember that in matthew jesus tells us in those scriptures that elijah and moses both showed up and elijah represents someone and moses represents someone in first thessalonians chapter 4 verse 15 and 17 It says this, For this we say to you by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord will by no means precede those who fall asleep. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of an archangel, and with the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and thus we shall always be with the Lord. There are two classes of people represented at the time of the great coming king, and that is those that are, that are dead, that are righteous, that will be resurrected, and those that are alive and will be translated. Moses represented those people that would be dead and resurrected, but Elijah represents the people at the end of time that will be translated into God's kingdom without seeing death whatsoever. So Elijah becomes a very important story for us, a very important aspect to look at because it tells us how to prepare for that translation when we will not see death if we are alive at the coming of Christ. So the second, that's the second idea that 
Elijah had a nature like ours, so if Elijah could overcome and be translated into God's kingdom, so can God's people at the end of time. The third idea, that the prayers of a righteous man are heard. He introduces that very vague idea in his text, but it's all throughout Paul's writings and other scriptural texts that righteousness comes from God alone. Where does a righteous man get his righteousness? And so in this prayer of James, we begin to see that he introduces this idea of righteousness. The fourth thing that he talks about with Elijah is that God is looking for one more great revival to save people from the impending death that's coming. And so when we look at the book of James and his mention of Elijah, we see that he's trying to point us to a deeper idea in the story of the book of Elijah. And Elijah had a very special place in the idea of Hebrew thinking. In fact, when John the Baptist in, uh, in the book of John was preaching, he's on the banks of the Jordan River and he's crying out mightily in such a powerful way that people could not ignore his preaching. They came from all over Judea to hear this man preach. And the scribes and the Pharisees were so moved by his preaching that they asked him a question in chapter, nine, of chapter 1, verse 19. They say to him, Now this is the testimony of John when the Jews sent priests and Levites from Jerusalem to ask him, Who are you? And he confessed and did not deny, but confessed, I am not the Christ. And when they asked him, What then? Are you Elijah? He said, I am not. Are you the prophet? And he answered, No. Why would they think? that he was Elijah the prophet. Where did that thinking come from? Well, they're getting it from Malachi the prophet who wrote about three or 400 years before this time period. In Malachi chapter 4, verse 5 through 6, Malachi reminds the world right before the great coming of the king. He says this in verse 5, Behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord and he will turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the hearts of the children to their fathers, lest I come and strike the earth with a curse. They were convinced that this man's message of repentance and of revival had to be Elijah. In fact, he preached the Elijah message so powerfully that it tells us that King Herod trembled at his words. You remember Jesus' trick question about John the Baptist. When he said that if you can handle it, if you can understand it. And he came and he asked the trick question, John's preaching, is it of God or is it of men? And they were so afraid to say that John's preaching was not of God that they withheld the answer because they knew the people hailed John as one of the greatest prophets that ever lived. In Matthew chapter 11, verse 14, Jesus gives us this corroborating evidence as to who John the Baptist was in Matthew 11, verse 14. And he said, if you are willing to receive it, speaking of John, he is Elijah who is to come. Now, this is no weird Hinduism kind of reincarnation. What Jesus is saying is that Elijah came with a certain spirit. A certain spirit was upon Elijah, a spirit of repentance, a, a spirit of preaching revival, a spirit of, re, of preaching return to obedience to God's law. And in John, that same spirit was manifested powerfully so, even more powerfully than Elijah. Because Jesus said, there is no prophet that has ever been like John the Baptist. He came in the very spirit, power, and message of Elijah to call people to repent and return to faithfulness to God, faithfulness to God's law, and faithfulness to God's ways. So what about today? Do you think that today we could use an Elijah's message? Do you think that we could use a return to the preaching of Elijah? Do you think that the world needs to gather at Jordan's banks again and hear that message? Not just Adventists or just Protestants or Catholics or Christians in large, but I think the world. It's okay for us to say the world needs to hear John preach because John preached to the world. He preached to anyone that came to him and listened. And then James, back to the book of James. I love James because he focuses on something what I find to be very strange about Elijah, of all the things written about Elijah in those eight, nine chapters of him in 1 Kings, of all the things he could have talked about when James is talking about the faith that people need to have, the revival that need to people have, the righteousness that people need to have, the repentance that people need to have, he brings them to this story in James chapter 5, verse 17 and 18 about Elijah. 
Elijah was a man with a nature like ours, and he prayed earnestly that it would not rain, and it did not rain on the land for three and a half years. And he prayed again, and the heaven gave rain, and the earth produced its fruit. James brings them to this story when Elijah cried out to God, saying, cause there to be no rain on the earth. And so that is going to be the focus of our story, this drought, this famine that came. Why does James pick up on that? And why did Elijah, of all the things he could have done, why did he cry out to God and say, let there be no rain? A little background before we get into the story with why Elijah chose that. Israel had fallen into their deepest apostasy. They had never sunk this far in their sins. In fact, Ahab is called the most wicked king that has ever lived. He led the people into their deepest apostasy. To make matters worse, he married Jezebel, who was the daughter of the high priest of Baal, the queen of the Zidonians. She was terrible. And she brought with her all of her prophets of Baal, 450 prophets of Baal and several hundred prophets to Ashtoreth. And she put to death all the Levites and priests of God. In fact, if it wasn't for Obadiah who hid 100 priests in the caves by 50, you remember the story? If, she would, if he wouldn't have done that, there would have been no priests. But the priests of God, the real priests of God, were hidden away in caves the prophets of Baal began administering religious service to the people of God. The temple was shut. The sanctuary service was closed. There was no sacrifices to God. Baal worship was completely unopposed in Israel and in the world in general. And if the light goes out in Israel, it goes out all over the whole world. That's how serious the situation was. Now, who was Baal? I know that's we think of, okay, Baal was just some he pictures of him, a stone god with weird arms and faces and heads or different depictions of him. But Baal worship was really considered, he was considered a fertility god. He was considered the god that caused everything to grow, children to be born. He was also called the storm god or the god of heaven. And he wasn't just the, the god of the Canaanites, he was also the god of the Egyptians. He was also known in Babylon as Baal, B-E-L. Here he's B-A-A-L. He was also, get this, known in Greek mythology as the chief god of heavens as Belos or Zeus. He's worshipped by all cultures with different names. He is the chief god of heaven, Baal. Now one source commenting on what constitutes Baal worship I thought was interesting. I tried to look up and say, okay, so I know who Baal is. He was kind of a, a god that was everywhere. But what was Baal worship? And the definition was this. It was uh, syncretism. They brought a little bit of this and a little bit of that. They brought a little bit of best of all religions into one. And he summed it up this way. You could say that Baal worship was pretty much just this saying, anything goes in Baal worship. In fact, we call that today hedonism. And hedonism, which is basically the main tenet of Satanism. Summed up by Aleister Crowley, that great Satanist proponent who said this, do as thou wilt. That is Baal worship. Baal worship is do what you want, how you want, when you want, and how you feel, and what you feel. And can you see that philosophy alive today? Are we not living in the very philosophical underpinnings of Baal worship? Today, it's one great, vast cry, anything goes, do what you want. Think what you think, feel what we feel. It's all legitimate. Every man is the captain of his own soul. Every woman, she's the governor of her own life. It's my body. I can do what I want with it. I can murder a child within it. I can change it from male to female. I can be a cow, an animal, a cat. I can eat what I want, destroy my body if I want. I can do whatever I want because anything goes. It is the very ideology of the humanity today. It's Baal worship. It hasn't went anywhere. It is still here, alive just in a different form. Could this be why the church struggles so that like Israel of old during the time of Elijah, that Baal worship was even entering into the church? The very attitude, and I know that this is so. Because when preachers stand up and they say, oh, yeah, 
I know the spirit of the age is okay and it's accepting of everyone and don't say anything to anyone that might offend or might hurt. Let everyone be their own ball. Let them do whatever they want. But when you mention something from the word of God that says don't dress that way, don't eat that way, don't talk that way, don't do those things, don't listen to that music, don't watch those kind of movies, you see the the brow curl up from the pulpit, you see the nose wrinkle and you see the rebellion rise up. How dare you tell me that I shouldn't do that? Or that that is not right. Or I shouldn't be doing this on Sabbath. Or I should be doing other things. That very spirit of rebellion, it's formed from this idea of bell worship that I am going to do what I think is right. The scripture says at the end of time, every man will be seeking to do what he thinks is right in his own mind. And Elijah came along and said, no, you cannot think what's right in your own mind. Your heart is deceitfully wicked. And the only thing that we can use to determine right and wrong is God's word. And if it says it, then I should believe it and live by it and do it. And we're living in a world, in a church even, that, that says, no, 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 I can do what I want with my tithes. I can do what I want with my offerings. I can give it where I please. I can send my kids to what school I choose to. That was the very idea of what Elijah was dealing with, what Baal worship was all about. It wasn't just a stone image that represented some false, invisible God. It was the very idea that I am going to rebel against God's authority, God's commandments, His statutes, His laws, His rules, and I'm going to live my life like I want to. That was in the church in the time of Elijah, and God sent him to go make this single statement, Elijah. You're going to go show the world who is God and who is not. We'll talk about that next week as we continue the Elijah message. But back to this idea of rain from the book of James. James says you need to pay attention to what Elijah chose to do for his first attack against Baal worship because it should be very important to us. Maybe it's better to look at what rain represented in the Bible. In Deuteronomy chapter 28, it's very clear of what it meant. Deuteronomy 28, and I pray that at home you're flipping through your pages of your Bible I know it's somewhere there on a shelf. (laughs) Pick it up, dust it off, and open its sacred pages. And look what God says in verse 12 of chapter 28. So beautiful. The Lord will open to you his good treasure, the heavens, to give the rain to your land in its season and to bless all the work of your hand. You shall lend to many nations, but you shall not borrow. The Bible, in many places, uh, the rain from God calls the corn to grow, the wine vats to be filled, the oil to just come out of the presses. When the rain was flowing, it was a sign of physical prosperity because God was pleased with you. He was blessed with your life of, of obedience. And God honored you by making you fat and full of success and prosperity. That's the ideology in the Old Testament with rain. But it stood for something deeper. The material goods were a symbol of something else that rain stood for. And when you get to the book of Zechariah, he says, Behold, I will send to you the the former and the latter rains. And it's clear in that prophetic book that the rain stood for the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. Rain stood the physical produce growing from the land and just having so much you're getting fat and full on it. It was a picture of spiritual wholeness with God. When the rains are falling, it's a symbol that your spirit is right, that you and God have a good relationship together. The work of the Holy Spirit actually has always been the Elijah message. The work of the Holy Spirit has always been to cause men to repentance, to receive the rain from God, to be full. In fact, John chapter 16, verse 8, it says that when he shall come, talking of the Holy Spirit, he will convict the world of sin and of righteousness and of judgment. This is the, the, what makes the fullness of spiritual living capable. When we allow the Holy Spirit to convict me. When I allow the Holy Spirit to guide me. When I allow the Holy Spirit to show me the law of God and obedience to Him. When I allow the Holy Spirit to show me that I need forgiveness and I need to turn back to God. This is when and where and how we become spiritually full with the rain from God. But conversely, the opposite is true about rain. Back to the book of Deuteronomy in chapter 11. The opposite can also be true about rain when it's withheld. And this is where our story of Elijah comes in. Elijah knew that the people were fat and full and sassy. (laughs) 
In Deuteronomy 11, verse 17, Least the Lord's anger be aroused against you and shut up the heavens so that there be no rain and that land yield no produce and you perish quickly from the good land which the Lord has given you. So as the Lord gives the rain for material blessing as a sign of a whole spiritual relationship with him, he withholds the rain for the opposite fact. He withholds the rain to show you. And you remember in the story of Elijah, what happens when there was no rain for the first year? It says that the green land was all burned up and the beautiful hills turned barren. By the second years, the animals were dying and there was dead bones and corpses laying everywhere. And people were emaciated and skinny and the land stunk and was desolate and barren. What do you think God is trying to say when he says, Elijah, I'm going to withhold the rain from this land? He's trying to show the inverse truth that that there's a spiritual famine of the soul. There's a spiritual brokenness between you and me. You have turned to Baal worship. You have turned to anything goes, doing what you please, forsaken my commandments, forsaken me. And the drought was to show them of an inner spiritual drought. This is why James is picking up on that in the New Testament writings. He's wanting to know and show you what real healing is. Yes, you can be healed from your sicknesses. Yes, you can be healed from your disease. But the real sickness, the sickness of all sicknesses, is a brokenness with God. And James says, look to Elijah and learn from him how to be whole with God. Oh, man. Trying to live by the spirit of this age, do as thou wilt, or anything goes, has brought the greatest spiritual drought and famine that the United States of America has ever seen in its life. In all of our 200 plus years of existence, we have never seen our country in the shape that is it in, that it's in. And there are people out there crying because it's a social gospel that needs to be preached. And people out there crying, we need equality. There's people out there crying, there's racism. There's people out there crying, all kind of reasons and problems. The wealthy people have too much money. The poor people don't have enough opportunities. And all these things may have some validity and truth. But the true problem in our country is that we are in a spiritual drought, a famine of the soul. We have turned our back on the law of God. We have turned our back on obeying Him. We have forsaken Him and turned to the worship of Baal. Of anything goes in our life. Now some people would argue with me and say, Man, Pastor, that's pretty stout and strong. I don't know of anybody that worships Baal. Every now and then we'll go into a store somewhere and we'll see a little Hindu god or some arms and elephants and weird stuff. But I, I really don't know anyone that worships Baal anymore. Right? And don't we have great physical prosperity? So if everything that you said is true, that we have physical prosperity and fatness physically, that must mean that, hey, spiritually we're doing pretty good. There's an exception to the rule. The exception to the rule is in Revelation chapter 3, verse 17. The exception to the rule is this, that because, and you know the text, Because you say, I am rich, I have become wealthy and have the need of nothing. Because I have the great physical reign of God, that must mean that my soul is spiritually filled too. And John in Revelation says, and do you not know that you are wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked? There is the exception to the rule that if our life is not producing the fruits of the Spirit, no matter how much physical goodness we have, we are spiritually bankrupt. But is there Baal worship alive today? Now, taken from the book called Prophets and Kings, you have to read this storyline in this great commentary on the life of Elijah. Is Baal worship still a thing of today or a thing of the past? From Elijah's experience during those days of discouragement and apparent defeat, there are many lessons to be drawn. The apostasy prevailing today is similar to that which in the prophet's day overspread Israel. The exaltation of the human above the divine. In the praise of popular leaders. In the worship of mammon, which is money. And in the placing of the teachings of science above the truths of revelation, multitudes today are following after Baal. Doubt and unbelief are exercising their baleful influence over mind and heart. And many are substituting for the oracles of God the theories of men. It is publicly taught that we have reached a time when human reason should be exalted above the teachings of the word, the law of God. The divine standard of righteousness is declared to be of no effect. 
The enemy of all truth is working with deceptive power to cause men and women to place human institutions where God should be and to forget that which was ordained for the happiness and salvation of mankind. And every time I hear some egghead professor from Harvard University, well, you know, the Bible can't be taken serious. It's, there's no way Moses could have wrote Genesis. That is Baal worship. Every time I hear some archaeologist saying, well, yes, Daniel is fairly accurate, but there's no way Daniel could have prophetically seen all that into the future. It must have been written, written much later in the first or second century. It's Baal worship. When our psychologist and our Scientists decry that the word of God, this thing given to the happiness of mankind, is a myth. Or some of it can believe, but not most of it. And there's no way that there could possibly even be a God. When mankind cry out in concerted voice from the world that we live in, whether it's in politics, whether it's at movie or Hollywood, or listen to them mock him on the news, or make fun of him on Saturday Night Live, a world in rebellion against God is Baal worship at its finest. Try to find him at Walmart. Try to find him at Home Depot. Try to find him in the commercial world. Try to find him in the advertising world. Try to find him at the holidays. It is Baal worship. We're just so immersed in it. We think it's the normal way of life. And so did they at the time of Elijah. They thought it was the normal way of life. The music, the movies, the fun, the restaurants, the eating, the going out. They just thought it was normal. But it was not normal. It was not God's way. It was the way of Baal. We are definitely in the age of anything goes. Away with that archaic bygone era of the Bible, that Victorian old way of looking at things. God has been banned. True worship suppressed. And we're replaced with a very pagan way of looking at the world. Well, that is now, and that was also in the time of Elijah. So God sends a drought. He sends a great famine. He's trying to get the attention of the world. And Elijah is about to do one of the most amazing things that has ever been done in human history in, in chapter 18. But before we get to chapter 18, the great showdown at Carmel, which is next week, a part two of the Elijah message, there's a very strange detour that he takes. He takes this detour through what the Bible calls the widow of Seraphath. He goes to a widow in this town called Seraphath before the great showdown at Mount Carmel takes place. And it's here where he gets the instructions to, to cause a famine. It's here where, where everything starts to take place. And I think it's here where James wants our mind to go to. Now, Seraphath, it's interesting. It means refinery. The word seraphath, the widow of seraphath, the, the, the widow of the place where metal is refined and melted down into its purest form. Interesting thought. When God is called the great refiner of men, I will sit as a fuller soap, as a refiner of men, of, of like fine silver and gold. There's all these ideas in the, in the Bible. I will make a man finer than the golden wedge of Ophir. And here we have a Bible story that's going to go to the place of the refiner through a widow to teach us how we can overcome Baal worship and return to true worship of God before the great day of the coming king. Now, 1 Kings chapter 17, we can pick up the story there. And let's read it. It's a, it's a bit to read, but I think we got time now, right? <laughs> Listen to this. Starting in verse 8, and we'll read through verse 14. Please read along. You need to hear these words. Now it happened after these things that the son of the woman, oh, verse 8, I'm sorry, verse 8, forgive me. Then the word of the Lord came to him, saying, Arise and go to Zarephath, which belongs to Sidon, and dwell there. See, I've commanded a widow there to provide for you. So he arose and he went to Zarephath, and when he came to the gate of the city, indeed a widow was there gathering sticks, and he called to her and said, Please bring me a little water in a cup that I may drink. And as she was going to, to get it, he called to her and said, Oh, please bring me a morsel of bread in your hand. And so she said, As the Lord your God lives, I do not have bread, only a handful of flour in a bin, and a little oil in a jar. And see, I am gathering a couple of sticks that I may, may go in and prepare it for myself and my son 
that we may eat it and die. And Elijah said to her, do not fear. Go and do as you have said, but make me a small cake from it first and bring it to me. Notice the specific instructions in a world that says, I'll do what I want to do. And afterward, make some for yourself and your son. For thus says the Lord God of Israel, the bin of flour shall not be used up, nor shall the jar of oil run dry until the day the Lord sends rain upon the earth. A few weeks ago, before this corona virus, COVID-19, got to use the right words, broke out on the world. <clears throat> Mary called me from Sam's. We don't keep much up with the news anymore. You can't trust half of it. And we just kind of stay to ourselves. And, and she said, I said, where are you? And she goes, well, I'm at Sam's. She went to pick up a few things for the house we're moving into. And she says, you would not believe what I see here. And I said, what? She says, there's everything gone. No toilet paper, no bread, no this, no that. I said, what is going on? And to, you know, since then, we've been keeping up with little news snippets and reels, and there's just lines. They're backed up at grocery stores. They can't, every time they get a load in, people are fighting and elbowing, and they're pulling. And not, it's not even really that bad yet. It's just an anticipation. Could you imagine what it would be like after a six-month quarantine in this country? Could you imagine if after a year the news got out, there's no more trucks coming in, there's no more food coming in, the world economy's crashed, and, and there's no more food, every man for himself. Could you imagine what the world would be like? And if I came as your pastor up to your house and you, you had one little loaf of bread and a little piece of peanut butter left and a, one bottle of water, and I as your pastor came up and said, uh, um, John Long would... Could I have that peanut butter and bread and, and, and give me that glass of water? And John, it's my last little bit. After this, I'm preparing my ceremonial meal. And I'm just going to die. Well, give it to me first. Could you imagine saying, hey, I, I need a roll of toilet paper. And you're like, it's, this is the last one I have. It's the last one in the world. This is what's going on with the widow of Seraphath. It's an extreme. Two years into the famine now. Her and her son are nearly starved to death. And they're going to make one little ceremonial meal together. And then they're going to lay back and die. But I want you to pay attention to the point of the story. Back to the book Prophets and Kings. Highlights beautifully why James is picking up on this story of Elijah. And how it relates to our, the time that we're living in the coming of the king. No greater test of faith than this could have been required. The widow had hitherto treated all strangers with kindness and liberality. Now, regardless of the suffering that might result to herself and child, and trusting in the God of Israel to supply her every need, she met this supreme test of hospitality by doing according to the saying of Elijah. Faith, trust in God, being tested at God's word is the very core idea of the Elijah message. In a world that doesn't have faith, that does not trust in God, and when it comes to being tested, they will fail every time because they do not believe in God's word, what he said. And the story is a great lesson book, but it's something much more about than just her having trust, physical trust and faith that God would supply her, her bread and her oil and her water. Because later in the story, we know that God honors that, and she has it all the way through the famine, but it's about something much deeper. James ain't talking about God will supply just your bread and water. James is saying, man, God will supply and react to your faith. Because there is a story much bigger, a picture much bigger than this in the book of Revelation, chapter 13. There is a supreme test coming to the world. In Revelation, the 13th chapter, there is a test coming right out of the book of 1 Kings, a, a widow of Seraphath test that's coming to mankind. And very similar, the world will be forced with the fact that they cannot buy, sell, trade. They cannot eat. They cannot do nothing unless, Revelation chapter 13, verse 15 through 17, unless they trust in the world and not in God. Listen to this, the 15th chapter, 13th chapter, verse 15 and 17. 
He was granted power to give breath to the image of the beast, that the image of the beast should both speak and cause as many would not worship the image of the beast to be killed. And he causes all, both small and great, and rich and poor, and free and slave, to receive a mark on their right hand or on their foreheads, and that no one may buy or sell except one who has the mark or the name of the beast or the number of his name. And we could talk a long time about who the beast is, but for now, let's just say that it is some power that raises up at the end of time that forces the world into a false system of worship. And if you don't go along with it, you're going to be just like the widow of Seraphath, without means to take care of yourself. That is the supreme test that's coming upon the earth. Will you be found faithful, trusting, and living by God's word despite what the world says? Or will you capitulate to the beast power system and worship falsely so that you can get your bread and water? Which are you going to do? Wow. What is going to help us get through that time of trouble? Because Daniel prophesies about what John is prophesying about. And Daniel says, it is a time of trouble such as never been on the face of the earth coming. And John, some 500 years later, reminds us that this is what Daniel was talking about, that time where man will be forced between Baal and God, between do whatever you please and serve God and keep his commandments. What comes along to help us out? Malachi, the fourth chapter, verse 5, we read it earlier. Let's read it again. God promises to do something to help the world make the right choice. In chapter 4 of Malachi, behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord, and he will turn the hearts of the fathers, verse 6, back to the children, back to the father. I thought we already read that. I thought we applied that to Jesus. But as many as Jesus' comments, when he makes prophecies, they're, they're called dualistic. In other words, they apply to the first coming of Jesus, and they also apply to the second coming of Jesus. You see this in the book of Joel, you see it in the book of Amos, you see it in the book of Matthew. They apply to the time of Christ in the first century, and they apply to the time of Christ's church at the end. Because this text, even though Jesus uses it to talk about the spirit and power of Elijah on John the Baptist, it's clear it's referring to the great and terrible day of the Lord, which the book of the Revelation says is the second coming. So before the second of coming of Christ, the Elijah message returns. Elijah comes back with the spirit and power of repentance and revival and turn back to obedience to God. The spirit of Elijah is on its way. Now, where would we find that message? Revelation chapter 14 is that very Elijah message giving to prepare, if you notice, it follows Revelation 13, the answer to this supreme test that mankind is going to come upon. The answer to how do they pass that test is found in the 14th chapter because as soon as Revelation 13 closes its decree with that fateful 666 number, Revelation 14, God goes right into the picture of the gospel. Then I saw another angel flying in the midst of heaven having the everlasting gospel to preach to those who dwell on the earth, to every nation, tribe, tongue, and people, a worldwide message, crying out with a loud voice, fear God and give glory to him, for the hour of his judgment has come, and worship him who made the heavens and the earth and the springs of water. It is the message of Elijah almost verbatim. And not to make it unclear what is at stake, verse 12 summarizes these three angels' messages, which is the Elijah message to the world. To summarize it, verse 12 says, Here are the patience of the saints. Here are they that keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. Here is a group of people that have faith in the living Christ and obey Him as proof or as evidence that their faith is genuine. They uphold the great law of God, the great standard of righteousness. They do not trample on it. They do not say, it's abrogated or done away with they hold it up high as evidence that they have true faith in the living God that they believe in the righteousness that comes from Christ alone they believe that the law points out and shows us our need of a savior if you do away with law there's no need of a savior everything goes every man's for himself just try to live a good life or live by some sacrament or what some person tells you is good or bad the Bible says if you live by God's law, it will condemn, it will convict, and there is a Christ to save, to cover. 
But the law is also the great standard of what sanctification is. It is the great standard of righteousness that the Holy Spirit is to work in us and lead us up to bring us into compliance with it. And the world has cast aside the law of God in favor of the institutions, ideas, maxims, and teachings of men. Revelation 14 is the return of Elijah. And the world will be, including you and I, tested just like the widow of Seraphath. In fact, Revelation 14, the, the side where it says, Here are they that have the faith of Jesus and the commandments of God. That part that says, Here are they that have the faith of Jesus is so beautifully foreshadowed in the rest of the story of the woman of Seraphath. This is where James and why James says you need to pay attention to this story of Elijah. Well, after Elijah is fed by her, surely as he promised, her bin of flour did not cease. Her jar of oil continued to be filled. She had food. But then there came a day, and for some reason, God fit, felt fit to put this part of the story in, in the canon. In verse 17, 1 Kings chapter 17, verse 17, this is the rest of the story, and then it ends. Now it happened after these things that the son of the woman who owned the house became sick, and his sickness was so serious that there was no breath left in him. So she said to Elijah, What have I to do with you, O man of God? Have you come to me to bring my sin to remembrance and to kill my son? And he said to her, Give me your son. So he took him out of her arms and carried him into the upper room where he was staying and laid him on his own bed. Then he cried out to the Lord and said, Oh, Lord, my God, have you also brought tragedy on the widow with whom I lodge by killing her son? And he stretched himself out on the child three times and cried out to the Lord and said, Oh, Lord, my God, I pray let this child's soul come back to him. And the Lord heard the voice of Elijah and the soul of the child came back to him and he revived. And Elijah took the child and brought him down from the upper room into the house and gave him to his mother. And Elijah said, See, your son lives. The entire gospel narrative of Christ is right there, foreshadowed by those who have faith in Jesus. Verse 18, the world is facing a judgment where our sins are going to be remembered. Our sins are going to be brought up in the books of heaven and they are going to be evaluated. Our life is going to be open, like Solomon says in Ecclesiastes for God will bring every work into judgment, every secret thing, whether it be good or evil. That day is here. The judgment of God has begun, according to Daniel the prophet. And our sins are going to be brought up in remembrance. Verse 20 of the text says this. And he cried out and said, oh, my God. Will you also kill her son? Her sins are being brought to remembrance. It wasn't her son that was killed, but it was another person's son, wasn't it? Revelation talks about that, that son of God, that lamb that was slain from the foundations of the world. Our forgiveness, our sins can be brought up and they can be covered. They can be forgiven because not her son was slain, but God's son was slain. And because God's son was slain, the sins of the world, my sins, they won't come up to remembrance for God. But because of that son that was slain, his righteous life is imputed to me. It covers my sin so they, they don't come up in the judgment. In verse 21 and 22, Elijah laid on the boy for three days and then he comes back to life. I mean, can that not speak more clearly of the resurrection? That after he laid in the tomb, it, that was one thing. He died, that was one thing. But Paul said what had to happen, what is, is ex, ex, important and exceedingly important, is that he rose from the dead. After three days, he comes back to life. And because of the resurrection, on the fact of the resurrection, Paul says we can have hope that he will forgive, pardon our sins, and bring us to the kingdom. In verse 23, you remember... Where were the disciples after the resurrection? Were they at Jesus' feet? Were they like, oh, we knew you were going to come back? It says that they were gathered in the upper room for fear of the Jews. And then Jesus came to the upper room and revealed himself. And then they left the upper room and went out and boldly and proclaimed the gospel of a risen Christ. They proclaimed, proclaimed boldly like Elijah the prophet did. 
That's why James says, look to the story of Elijah and the widow of Seraphath. The world must hear this Elijah message of the everlasting gospel. They must hear that righteousness can come by faith alone, but you cannot leave out the law. If you take the law out from the gospel, you have no gospel at all. Paul brings them back beautifully in Revelation 14. They come together because those that do not have the faith of this woman, those that do not have their sins forgiven and washed away, those do not return to obedience and allegiance to God. Revelation 13, chapter 4 is very clear, very grim of what their outcome is. Revelation chapter 13, verse 4. So they worship the dragon who gave authority to the beast and they worship the beast saying who is like the beast and who is able to make war with him. Verse 7, it was granted for him to make war with the saints and to overcome them and authority was given him over every tribe, tongue and nation. In verse 8, all who dwell on the earth will worship him whose names have not been written in the book of life of the Lamb slain from the foundation of the world. The outcome is very clear. Whether they believe in God or not, whether they believe in science or not, whether they laugh along with the news organizations or not, whether they, they make fun and poke fun of Christians or not, no matter what their belief is, the outcome is sure. If they do not have faith in the Lamb of God, if they have not found where real repentance and righteousness lies, if they have not turned from their sins, if they have not become obedient to God's law, they will worship the beast in his image they will follow along with the entire world and the bible is clear that they will perish it's the message of the gospel it is the message of first kings chapter 17 it's the message of revelation 14 repent or perish that's simple turn to god with all your living heart and soul or perish elijah cried out mightily John the Baptist cried out, Jesus cried out, and like a chorus, it is sounded from the book of Revelation chapter 12, and the dragon was wroth with the woman and the remnant of her seed and went to make war with them who keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. Revelation 14, 12, here is the patience of the saints. Here are they that keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. Revelation chapter 22, verse 14, blessed are those who do his commandments. They may have right to the tree of life and may enter through the gates of the city. The law and the gospel will once again cry out to the world. Come out of your Baal worship. Come out of anything goes. Come out of do what thou wilt. Come out of Babylon and return to the God, the creator of heavens and earth. Return to the God of our fathers. Return to obedience to him and trust in his word. Because our story in 1 Kings ends with these cryptic words, this beautiful idea. It's the last words that we hear from this woman of Seraphath. In verse 24 of chapter 17, she says this. <laughs> then the woman said to Elijah, Now by this I know that you are a man of God and that the word of the Lord is in your mouth is the truth. It is time. For us to say to the world that this is the word of God and it is truth. It is time now to stand up to our professors, our scientists, our paleontologists, our archaeologists, our sociologists, our psychologists, our psychiatrists, our doctors, our lawyers, the talking heads, the thinking tanks, the professionals of the world and say, uh, excuse me. <laughs> God's word must be heeded in the world again. I know it's archaic. I know it's hokey. I know people don't believe that no more. But Elijah will return to this earth. And this will be his message. He will cry out. I have a church member that's really struggling with this quarantine business. And she came to me and I love her dearly. And I understand where she's coming from. And she said, you know, Pastor, I don't want to be stuck in a hole with toilet paper and cans. But I want to be out preaching. This is the end game. This is something's happening. Something's going on here. <laughs> I couldn't agree with her more. I think it's good reason to have caution for what we're doing. But there is a time when our caution will not be validated before God. There is a time where our caution will be in direct conflict with God and the world. And we will have to make a choice. We will have to choose. We're going to serve God or Baal, one or the other. 
I think there's a time coming when we got to get out of our holes. You remember Obadiah? Remember where the priests of God, where were they? They were hid away in caves. It's time for God's people to get out of their caves. And when we see that the coming of our Lord, the King's coming is soon, it's time to get out of our caves. God in heaven, church, when are we going to let go of the indulgences of the world? When are we going to let go of her movies and her music and her pride? When are we going to let go of her higher places of, of education and her institutions and her schools? When are we going to take our kids out of Babylon? When are we as a people of God are going to turn our energies and money upon the gospel message? When? If not now, when are we ever? If we haven't heard the message of Elijah today, then we are in the most serious trouble that we've ever been. It is time for God's people to boldly come out of those caves of Obadiah and join with Elijah and proclaim the gospel, proclaim the law, and the world needs to hear it and they need to hear it clear. My children need to hear it. My mother and father, my brothers, my friends, my family, they need to hear it. Repent or perish. It is the message. Turn to the everlasting gospel. Turn to Christ. Return to obedience to His law or perish. Tell them there's a judgment to face. But there's a Savior to pardon. There's a law that condemns, but a Savior that covers. One more quote, and we close. One more quote on the life of Elijah. Today there is need of the voice of stern rebuke. For grievous sins have separated the people from God. Infidelity is fast becoming fashionable. We will not have this man to reign over us is the language of thousands. The smooth sermons so often preach make no lasting impression. The trumpet does not give a certain sound. Men are not cut to the heart by the plain sharp truths of God's word. When will the voice of faithful rebuke be heard once more in the church? God cannot use men who in the time of peril, when the strength and courage and influence of all are needed, are afraid to make a firm stand for the right. He calls for men who will do faithful battle against wrong, warring against principalities and powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. It is to such as these that He will speak the words, Well done, good and faithful servant. Enter thou into the joy of the Lord. Let's hear our closing song as John David leads us out now. Jesus 
sad, broken hearted at an altar. I knelt, I found peace that was so, so real. And all that he asks is a child like I trust and a heart that is learning to lead learning to lead learning to lead I'm learning to lean on Jesus finding soul we pray that you would teach us to lean on Jesus and it's going to take all of his spirit in our weakened flesh to turn to you with all our hearts again to be like Elijah ready to be translated Lord to be like those that turn with all their hearts to you again and broke off the worship of this world we need to lean on you we need the power and spirit of Elijah to be upon us. We need the Holy Spirit down in our heart and in our mind. We need your transforming grace and power to deliver us from our own selves and from the world around us. God, hear our cry. We are weak men. We are weak women. We are inundated by the world. We struggle and we, we have problems. And this virus has compounded our life and filled us with fear. God, help us during all this commotion with all our heart to turn to you, to trust in you. And may you fill us with that very spirit that animated Elijah, that animated John and Jesus, and down through the centuries. Many men and women have been animated by that same voice of stern rebuke, but loving compassion. Help us, God, we pray, to turn to you now with all our heart. We love you, Lord. We praise your holy name. We bless your name and ask that you would be with us today. In Jesus' name, amen. Friends, I want to say thank you for tuning in. Please share this on Facebook and get it out to as many people as you can. We'll see you next week at the same time for part two of Elijah Message. We'll be talking about the showdown at Mount Carmel. May God bless. Jesus.